we're very concerned. We're just trying to take every measure we can to get her home. We just want to at least hear something from him, from her. We have no answers. We have not heard from her. That was the aunt of missing person, Jalasia Finkley. Jalasia has been missing since October 20th, which was one day before her 18th birthday. Is this a simple runaway case? I don't think so. We've got a lot of kind of scary things at play here, and we need your help. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Jalasia Finkley. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today and caring about these cases like I do. We've got a lot going on in today's case, and I really feel like time is of the essence. I mean, that could certainly be said for every case, but one of my big fears in this case is we might be looking at a potential trafficking situation, and in cases like that, um, the the faster we can get to these people, the, the better. And I'm hopeful in some way that that's the type of case we're looking at, because if we're not looking at that situation, we're looking at something a lot darker. But let's go ahead and jump into all the details here, starting with NamUs. And I was actually kind of surprised to see that a NamUs profile has already been created. Jalasia Finkley, a female American Indian, Alaska native, date of last contact, October 20th, 2020, missing from New Bedford, Massachusetts at the age of 17. Of course, she turned 18 the day after that. Uh, Stands at five feet, three inches tall, weighs around 110 pounds, and she is enrolled with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Um, Name is, we could see the case was actually created just six days after her disappearance. I'm, I'm thankful that we're seeing faster and faster records being created here at NamUs. It's such an important component. Um, not missing from tribal land. She has gone off all, all social media and has not contacted any friends or family. Of course, we got a big cause for concern when we're talking about 17, 18 year old that is regular on social media and all of a sudden that gets completely cut off. Uh, brown hair hazel eyes. She's got a birthmark on her left cheek. You can actually see it in some of the photos, even in this photo here. It's in the shape of a triangle, very distinct. Uh, Also a tattoo of a single rose down the middle of her back. Unfortunately for clothing and accessories, we don't get a description here. And I don't think I've seen any description on what she was wearing. Um, For images and documents, I don't think they really have anything else, but we've got contact information in the description box below, including the case number. So if you do contact New Bedford Police, please be sure to give them that case number to help them connect the information with the right case. Over at Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe, uh, uh, dash nsn.gov. Uh, we're going to learn just a little bit about her tribe. The Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, also known as the people of the first light, has inhabited present day Massachusetts and eastern Rhode Island for more than 12,000 years. After an arduous process lasting more than three decades, the Mashpee Wampanoag were acknowledged as a federally recognized tribe in 2007. In 2015, the federal government declared 150 acres of land in Mashpee and 170 acres of land in Taunton as the tribe's initial reservation on which the tribe can exercise its full tribal sovereignty rights. The Mashpee tribe currently has approximately 2,600 enrolled citizens. And I don't know if you noticed, but one of the slides that they're running up here is actually specifically about the search for Jalasia. Uh, They have a page dedicated to her as well in a statement that they issued on October 25th, 2020. We need your support to quickly bring a young tribal member home. Mashpee Wampanoag Police Department is working closely with the New Bedford Police Department to bring Jalasia home. Thankfully, we have several news sources that have picked up on this story and are reporting on it. So we've got a lot of details and a very big twist to go through with all this. Uh, in terms of Jalasia as a person, um, she's very young, so I couldn't find a whole lot of information about her. I can see it looks like uh, she might perform occasionally as a rap artist. Uh, I've seen that she made an appearance on a lo- community access local television show uh, that was talking about local rap artists. Um, but other than that, just 
from what I can see, just kind of typical 17, 18 year old um, trying to enjoy life, trying to have fun and probably having a heck of a time doing it in this year. An 18 year old mash P woman is missing, having last been seen October 20th. Jalasia Finkley, who turned 18 on October 21st, was last seen in New Bedford around 4 to 5 p.m. on the 20th and last texted a friend that night that she was meeting with a man named Louise Barboza. Continuing at newbedfordguide.com, family seeks public's help. We have a comment here. Um, I, initially, I thought it might be from her mother because of the phrasing of the comment, but I found her mother's name in a different article, and it's not this name. So this is likely a different family member, possibly an aunt. This is my little baby missing over 24 hours on her 18th birthday. She's constantly changing her hairstyles obviously an important consideration. It's her little brother's birthday too. She would have called him. He's nine and been calling her, not like her, said Marie Shauna. The tribe's police department has expressed concern that it's possible that she was allegedly abducted by a 37-year-old man named Luis Robert Zaragoza Barbosa. Yeah, so we're talking about a man with a 20-year age difference. Her abductor, Luis Zargosa, is 36 years of age and is six foot seven in height and weighs approximately 275 pounds. So we're also talking about a very big person, uh, especially compared to Jalasia standing at five foot three and weighing 110 pounds, at least according to the information at NamUs. Uh, a couple big causes for concern here. I mean, obviously, according to one of her friends, She's uh, texting that she's going to be meeting up with this guy. She meets up with this guy. And now she's missing. So, of course, I think the next question on a lot of our minds is, uh, where is Luis? And this is a picture of him. Continuing at capenews.net, Mashpee Tribe posts $1,000 reward. The Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe is offering a $1,000 reward for the safe return of Jalasia Finkley. Ms. Finkley was last seen with 36-year-old Luis Zaragoza, who also goes by Luis Barbosa, according to a statement from Tribal Chairman Cedric Cromwell. Ms. Finkley could have been taken out of Massachusetts, the statement from Mr. Cromwell said. Um, and you know, it's tough because I look into a lot of these cases and a fear that comes up very typically for the families is, is my missing loved one being trafficked. And in many of those cases, I try to kind of steer away from that theory because it just doesn't seem likely in several cases here. We've got some signs that are really making that a strong consideration. And for me, this is one of them that right off the bat, we're getting statements that she could have been taken out of the state. And, you know, we've we've done some research in terms of we've talked to Destiny Rescue about how trafficking works internationally. We've covered several cases here where we've discussed trafficking within our country, um, getting them out of the state immediately can be a component to that. Uh, so this is just ringing that bell for me a little bit. And that's why I just wanted to tell you guys, that's, that's kind of where my mind's going with this. And honestly, with some of the later developments, that theory, um, might firm up, or you might believe that it gets blown completely out of the water, but let's continue with more information at capecod.com. Council leader Cedric Cromwell stated Wednesday that federal agencies have not started looking into the case, but they must under Savannah's act and the not Invisible Act, laws passed by the United States Congress related to missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, and this article was posted October 29th. So seems like fairly early on within a week, a little over a week of her disappearance, he's concerned that federal agencies have not started looking into the case, but we've already heard some information that she might have been taken across state lines. She might have been abducted. We're hearing some pretty strong triggers for federal involvement. And then he's pointing out um, Savannah's act and the not invisible act as well. He's got some additional comments here. Sadly, the growing number of missing indigenous women across the country do not receive the attention that our Caucasian neighbors receive, he wrote. The numbers are staggering. Our women are abducted at a rate 10 times higher than other ethnicities. We have to work harder to bring attention to Jalasia and we need your help. 
Cromwell said tribal members had been searching the woods, putting posters up in train stations, and walking the streets of New Bedford looking for her. It's hurtful and it's painful, he said. I pray to God that she's safe, and it's a matter of time before we can bring her home. So let's just do a quick tap on these new acts. Um, they're very recent. Savannah's Act addresses alarming number of missing or killed Native women. This is an article from September 28th, 2020. Last week, the House passed Savannah's Act. It requires the Department of Justice to strengthen training, coordination, data collection, and other guidelines related to cases of murdered or missing Native Americans. I'm kind of wondering if just the pressure of that having passed recently is even playing into why that record got entered in a NamUs so fast. President Trump is expected to sign it into law. The bill is named for Savannah LaFontaine Greywind. You might remember that. That's a case we actually did cover here on the channel. I'll have links to it down below. One of the most heartbreaking and disturbing cases, honestly, that we've looked into here. She was 22 years old and eight months pregnant when she was murdered by a neighbor. And unfortunately, the detail gets a lot worse than that. Sarah Deer, professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Kansas, and also a citizen of the Muskegee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, said... Almost 80% of Native women will experience some form of physical abuse, and over half will experience some form of sexual assault. It hasn't gotten the kind of attention it deserves. Now, there's another component to this, and of course, that's the Not Invisible Act, and it complements Savannah's Act. This is from harpersbazaar.com. By aiming to increase coordination efforts to reduce violence against Native Americans, in particular, the bill mandates that the Department of the Interior designate an official within the Bureau of Indian Affairs to coordinate prevention efforts, grants, and programs related to missing Indians and the murder and human trafficking of Indians. Additionally, the Interior and the Justice Department must establish a joint commission that will develop recommendations on how to combat violence against Indians native peoples. So Savannah's act effectively is once there is an issue like that, how do we how do we address that case? How do we pull the resources together to help that case, which is a big question that we have in this particular case as well. The Not Invisible Act kind of a step before that. How can we stop these types of things from happening? Is it education initiatives? What what can they do to really start changing the culture of these problems at a much earlier level than girl has gone missing? We now need to pull these resources together. So two very important components uh, and recent additions. Boston25news.com reports 18-year-old Jalasia Finkley was last seen in New Bedford near her apartment on October 20th. Her family is worried about her and concerned that she may have been a victim of foul play. And I do think that that's a big consideration here. I just don't know if the foul play that we're talking about is the trafficking situation or something far worse. Uh, Jalaja's aunt, Tia Costa, said it's not like her. She's never not gone missing for a week or a day. This is not normal. The day after Jalasia vanished, she turned 18, missing a chance to celebrate her birthday with her family. Jalasia ha also has missed an important medical procedure that was planned. And there's no details really about what that procedure is, um, but it seems it's stated here plainly that it's important. There's another quote that I've seen from her aunt uh, that it was a pretty serious procedure as well. Doctors reached out to us asking why she hasn't come in, and we have no answers. We have not heard from her, Costa said. And then what about Barboza? Does the family know anything about this guy? According to this article, as far as the family knows, there was no relationship between the two. So we're not getting a clear distinction there that this is someone they were unfamiliar with, just that their belief is that there wasn't a relationship between 17-year-old Jalasia and 36-year-old Barbosa. Uh, there has been no communication from Jalasia or Barbosa in more than a week. We're just trying to take every measure we can to get her home. We at least want to just hear something from him, from her, Costa said. And then, of course, more time is passing, and this article says it all. Concern grows. Um, but a pretty important consideration that happens around this. 
kind of a strange consideration. Barbosa's Twitter account now contains newly uploaded photos of Jalasia and Barbosa together. Uh, and we've actually got some footage of it here. Let me play this for you guys real quick. Um, so she is actually sitting. Yep, yeah, she's right here. And then we've got a FaceTime that's going on between the two of them. Unfortunately, the video that was released, there is no audio on it. Um, but if nothing else, we can make an assumption there's some type of relationship that they've had. And if we can get a sense of the timing of when these videos happened, that might give us a little more insight into what's going on with this case. What does the family say when these videos are released? Jalaja's aunt, Tia Costa, tells me the videos are alarming because the video is months old. If he's going to post a video, you want to see her in a video shot today, not something shot seven months ago. I want to see her today, Costa said. So, of course, that raises some alarms because why is he posting video of her that's old currently? Is he trying to portray that they're actually fine, that they're somewhere spending time together? You know, theoretically, she's 18 at this point. If she wanted to go run off and be with someone that was 37, 47, 57, she, she, she would be able to. No one would, would really be able to stop that. So is that kind of the story that he's trying to lay out by posting this video? Her aunt continues, I'm obviously fearing the worst. Luis Barboza's mother told me she has not heard from her son in more than a week and she is concerned for him, she said. So obviously they're in touch with his family as well. Um, yeah, very strange to have a social media tap like that and for it to be old footage I'm certainly concerned. CapeCodTimes.com reports, according to a statement Friday from the New Bedford Police Department, their detectives were en route to Florida. The suspect was there. They were zeroing in on him. According to a statement from the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office, a deputy with that office was assisting a task force, a federal task force, uh, including the U.S. Marshals. So obviously the federal help that... The tribe was calling for early on did seem to finally arrive a special task force was put together obviously they knew what they were doing because they tracked him down to a different state uh, then we have the local county sheriff's office helping with the approach the suspect fired one shot from a car in a mcdonald's parking lot and that was on ferdin boulevard in crestview Officers returned fire, and the suspect, identified as a fugitive, wanted on, an, on out-of-state charges of kidnapping, died at the scene, the sheriff's statement says. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement is investigating. Finkley is still missing. So a couple of interesting things that we can tell from this statement. First of all, um, they were drumming up charges for kidnapping. So they had to have, they've, they have, they have to have some other information about what's going on here. And we're going to find out some details. Maybe they do. And maybe some of the activity around her being picked up by this guy is enough for them to warrant that. I, I'm not sure or not, but um, maybe it's perhaps that she's 17 years old on the day that he picks her up. Maybe they're really going to stick with that and use that for helping to bolster the kidnapping charge. Um, but she's not with him. He gets in a shootout in a McDonald's parking lot when he's being approached by officers. Why? Why is he going to risk himself like that? Why is he going to shoot at officers knowing full well what, what the outcome is likely to be in that situation? Is it because he's already done something terrible to her? Is it because he's protecting something else? I think we're still looking at the two possibilities that we started with this video, uh, either something very bad where she might not be with us anymore and he is afraid to face up to that, or maybe this was some type of trafficking transaction. Maybe he's already taken her to someone else and she's been moved to another location. Maybe he was paid for that. Maybe he's afraid to get captured because then he's going to try to roll on these people that it might be scarier to face them than even law enforcement. I don't know, but there's something that happens here where he's willing to die for whatever part he has played in this. 
Uh, and that, of course, seriously, seriously concerning. The NBPD continues to apply extensive resources to this investigation and remains dedicated to resolving the case of missing person Jalasia Finkley, a statement from New Bedford Police said. We will continue to vigorously investigate this case and collaborate with other law enforcement ag agencies to pursue all information. Michelle Nicholson, public information officer with the Okaloosa Sheriff's Office, said that office was not involved in the investigation beyond the fact that one of its deputies assisted the U.S. Marshal Service out of Pensacola. Local station WJAR actually got a quote from someone that witnessed the shootout. I heard the yelling, but I thought it was interference, maybe in the speaker. I didn't realize it was going on because there was nothing going on when I pulled up. They were yelling at him or her, like I said, I don't know, trying to get them to put the gun down is what I'm assuming. I heard gun down, and then I heard what I thought was maybe backfire or something, but I think it was a low caliber gun. And then they opened fire, a witness said. Now on the heels of the shootout and the death of Luis Zaragoza, more details are finally released that are giving us a little more insight into why I think this was considered a kidnapping situation pretty early on. Finkley was last seen in New Bedford getting into Luis Zaragoza's vehicle. So it sounds like they've got a witness that actually sees her getting in his car, which investigators learned he recently rented from Logan Airport in Boston. As a result of the ongoing investigation into this matter, police learned Finkley's cell phone was last used to call the suspect shortly before she got into the vehicle. Further investigation determined that Zaragoza turned off his own cell phone minutes after Finkley got into his rented vehicle. Huge cause for concern there. Why is this guy turning off his own cell phone right when he's picked her up? And that's one of those things where... If this was someone that was put it, had put a plan together that he was going to kidnap this young woman, do something terrible to her, um, he's enacting that plan very soon. It's just it's showing there's intent there that he doesn't want to be tracked from this point forward. But the thing I'm getting caught on is is that something really that he would have figured out for himself? He would have that much foresight and planning, but then he would wind up in a shootout at a McDonald's. I just, I, I don't know if it's that much foresight on his behalf or if he was instructed to do that by other people that are like, hey, if we're going to do this deal, if you're going to bring us this girl, here's the things that you got to do. Um, it just, it, it, it seems to me like we're still in that possibility of something else going on here. Other people that might be related to this case. Uh, during the course of the investigation, police were able to locate Finkley's discarded cell phone on Route I-40 in New Bedford, approximately five miles away from where she first got into the vehicle. Another huge warning sign. Her, her phone is thrown out the window, it sounds like, of a highway five miles after she's picked up. Now, there's something about that that I think we just need to touch on in terms of what if she did want to run away? from her family for some reason the day before she could legally do that and be perfectly fine. Also the day before I believe her surgery her surgery was actually scheduled for her birthday. Uh, was it something about that that made her nervous? She didn't want to go through with that and she was going to run away something along those lines. I think there's a possibility that you have to consider that perhaps she could have said, okay, I'm going off to my new life and threw the phone out the window. But then why do they find him? He's alone. Why does he decide that they're going to get into a shootout? I'm really worried that something has already happened in the vehicle at this point. I'd be very curious if they do have a witness that saw her get into his vehicle. Did they see anyone else in the vehicle with them? Could it be that there was another person in that vehicle as well? Uh, police determined Zaragoza had left the state and traveled south along the eastern seaboard to Florida. He then traveled to Texas before driving back to Florida. What is that travel about? And that's probably one of the biggest things that makes me concerned, that we're looking at kind of what potentially could be a trafficking situation. If this is a guy that did all this on his own, decided he was going to enter life and he was going to hide her somewhere, and then go on the run, is this what he's going to do? He's going to go to Florida, go to Texas. Hey, go back to Florida. 
I, I just, I don't know. It seems like something else is at play here. Police have been able to locate surveillance footage from some of the places Zaragoza traveled during the course of the last two weeks, but none of the surveillance shows Finkley. Another big cause for concern there, uh, especially if they've located surveillance within a day of him leaving the area or something like that. I'd be, I'd be very curious to hear the timeline of the surveillance that they got along these two weeks and the locations. Um, because if we're talking about, he stopped at, uh, you know, a gas station or a restaurant or something within a matter of hours and she already wasn't seen at that point. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's pointing to, to both of the situations are terrible. The U.S. Marshals were able to successfully locate the suspect last Wednesday night and began surveilling him. Police here in Massachusetts sought and obtained an arrest warrant for the suspect, charging him with kidnapping and larceny of a motor vehicle. So I would bet that rental, obviously, he takes the car and maybe the rental was for a day or two and he just doesn't return it. And now it's turning into a stolen vehicle situation as well. So over at boston25news.com, we do get a comment from Jalasia's mother, Amanda Costa, and she is extremely worried. I'm kind of glad she wasn't in the car at that moment, Costa said, but it's still scary because now I have absolutely no clue where she is. It's just scary to me. Uh, definitely. And especially knowing with how far he traveled, the different places that he went to, Florida being a very easy access point for even getting her out of the country. Um, yeah, yeah, it's I'm just really, really concerned on this. Is my baby girl alive? Is she okay? Is she going to make it home safe? I just want to know where she's at, her mother said. There's a lot of information coming out about this case. It seems like about every hour there's a new article. Um, I had actually already finished editing a version of today's episode, but I saw some new details I had to share with you guys. So I've kicked the camera back on over at boston25news.com. Uh, so they're talking about the arrest warrant and new information that they're able to see from that, uh, the arrest war warrant for Luis. According to that report, Jalasia was 17 years old. She turned 18 the next day. She was also five months pregnant. So um, that's something I was wondering with the information we were kind of hearing before. But uh, here, yeah, confirmed. She was also five months pregnant. And of course, that really pushes me into um, thinking that something really, really bad could have happened here. Earlier on October 20th, Jalasia started a two-day medical procedure at a Boston clinic. On the 21st, when Jalasia didn't return to Boston to complete the procedure, the clinic called Amanda Costa, her mother, warning her that Jalasia's life was at risk if she didn't follow through. Barboza's cell phone pinged on Route 95 South in Hopkinton, Rhode Island. So now we've got another state that's been added to this, and it pinged there about an hour and 15 minutes after Jalasia's cell phone was discarded. Um, so it's really starting to look like the situation I was theorizing about him possibly being on the run. Uh, it, that might actually be what's happening here. It appears Barbosa spent the night at highway rest stops in Woodbridge and Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The next day, he drove north to New York City, where his car was picked up in the Lincoln Tunnel. Then it turned south again, going back to the Woodbridge rest area, then through Washington, D.C. and South Carolina. The, the movement just sounds very erratic, and it does sound like it's kind of frantic and, and he's just on the run. On October 23rd, Barbosa was tracked to a Jacksonville, Florida McDonald's where he ordered a small meal with one drink. For the first time, surveillance showed the interior of his car, and there was no sign of her in there. Uh, Jalasia could be anywhere from New Bedford to New York, New Jersey, Texas, and Florida. Amanda Costa is holding out hope that she will see her daughter again. I'm hoping she's alive out there, she said. She can see me right now and find her way home. That's what I'm hoping. So on top of that list, um, I think we also throw Rhode Island in there. Uh, he, he went through Washington, D.C. and into South Carolina as well. So really, it's a significant amount of, of 
area that we're talking about. Now, the family is running a GoFundMe. Uh, we can see they had a goal of 5,000. They've already exceeded that goal. Um, it initially said that this was to help pay for the investigation. They then had to put an update there where they were saying there's a misunderstanding. Um, I'm sure because some people were like, you're not going to have to pay for this investigation. You've got you know local and federal resources that are working on this. They're being clear that it's they're asking for donations for a private investigator. And considering one of the two extremely likely outcomes in this situation, I think that that is certainly something to still be considered, um, especially if they could find a private investigator that specializes in um, in trafficking. I, I would I would certainly be looking very strongly in that direction if this was my family member that's missing. Of course, on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters through PayPal, Patreon, and people that buy merchandise at lordandarts.com, we're making a donation to this GoFundMe just as soon as I'm done filming today's episode. But this is where I ask you, brain scratchers, what is going on with this case? Are you of the same mind as me that we're really looking at one of two pretty distinct possibilities, maybe three if you include that for some reason she wanted to run away from home? It just, I, I don't know that I can keep that in consideration considering the shootout that happened and why would he have acted that way? All the travel that he did in that two weeks, it just, it really seems to me like either we've got one person responsible for a very terrible occurrence and we need to still find the answers for that, or we possibly have other people that are involved in this. And that's something that I'm really hoping, uh, the investigators are going to stay on. The federal investigators are going to stay on. I mean, if this is a trafficking situation, we've been seeing some pretty big trafficking busts that have happened over the past year or two in particular. Maybe this will be the thread that they can pull on and not only bring Jalasia home, but maybe help some other kids that need to be freed from a terrible situation as well. Um, I think that's kind of the best that we can hope for in a situation like this. Before I end today's video, I want to thank several new patrons. Thank you, Jessica McGee, Lisa Andrews, Ellie Driscoll, and Jennifer Osheski. I appreciate your guys and your support. If you'd like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com where you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, or buy merchandise. Do you have a smartwatch? One of the things you'll find at the Lord and Arts online store is free and that is the brand new Searchlight faceplate. If you've got a smartwatch that can use the app Facer, you can download a Searchlight faceplate directly from them. There's absolutely no cost, and there are four different regions. Not only does it have the Searchlight artwork and the Lord and Arts logo on it, but it will show you cases from those particular regions. So please check that out. And a big thank you to Jay Embry for putting those together and helping us offer that. Uh, I ask for your help here, guys. Um, please help us share this video. Uh, Massachusetts, Florida, Texas. I think those are the big areas where we need to focus. Those might be the areas where someone has caught a glimpse of Jalasia, possibly if she was being moved, possibly if she was being transferred from one person to another, or those are the locations where maybe people have heard a little piece of this story and that piece of the story needs to be called in. If you're one of those people, all the info you need is in the description box below. Please find it within your heart to do the right thing and send in that information so this family can have the answers that they really desperately need and deserve. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. I'll see you again on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch right here on the Lord and Arts channel.